Okay, welcome back, guys. So uh, the last thing that we'll touch on is the control of breathing, right? How how does this all kind of put together? Like we had mentioned in the previous lectures, that the control of breathing, or breathing, is something that's done automatically, um, subconsciously, and involuntarily from the very first breath we take as a baby from birth until the very last breath we take. It is something that is uh, controlled by you know, the input and processing of multiple different inputs. Uh, the primary being chemoreceptors, which are located um, in the brainstem as well as in the periphery of the carotid and aortic bodies. We also have inputs um, from uh, those metaboreceptors and the mechanoreceptors in the muscles. Um, so when we have higher amounts of metabolites build up in muscles, that facilitates breathing as well as just movement in the, in the joints as well. In fact, if you had someone who was ventilated and under anesthesia and you did passive range of motion, you'd actually find that breathing rate would increase, right? Uh, there are also mechanoreceptors in the lung. So um, there is a reflex, the herring brew reflex, that if you take a large breath and the lungs go under stretch, the drive to breathe actually decreases, which makes sense. We don't want to be overfilling our lungs if they're already you know, filled up. Then there's obviously conscious inputs. Like we mentioned before, while breathing is or involuntary, we do this subconsciously, we can have volitional overrides temporarily, right? So we can you know, cause ourselves to breathe faster. We can hyperventilate. We can cause ourselves to breathe a little bit slower. We can adjust our rate and depth and even the pattern consciously. There's also limbic system inputs. So our emotions, um, you know, tie into this. You know, if we're, st if we're stressed out, if we're anxious, um, we know that's going to raise the breathing rate. Um, and, um, you know, there's also inputs in the reticular activating system. We're finding that Again, breathing is very, very, in, in many respects, a state-dependent behavior. Um, it'll match according, it'll match breathing to, depending on the state. Um, we think a lot of the autonomic nervous system has a role in here, um, you know, as well. So um, all of these inputs come in um, to the brainstem, which is where the respiratory central pattern generator is. Guys may remember this from, um, you know, neuroanatomy. Central pattern generators are basically, um, you know, microcircuits within the brain that allow for stereotyped and repetitive movements that we need to do subconsciously. The walking is one, right? We don't think about walking; it's just something that we have this motor program that's um, oriented. Um, that we take inputs from the periphery to adjust it according to the state we're being exposed to. Breathing's the same exact way. We can, you know, adjust the rate and the volume according to demands. A classic example of that would be exercise. When we're exercising, we actually find the microcircuitry is a little bit different than what would be at rest. Um, we, you know, we think that has a lot to do with uh, different areas of the brain that kind of become active. Um, you know, so one thing I do want to comment on that breathing rate and volume, right? Um, like most regulatory systems demonstrate significant breath to breath variability. That's a good thing. It's, it's analogous to heart rate variability, um, that, you know, we're going to have small little fluctuations, right? That, that reflects a pretty good and healthy system. Um, decreased breath to breath variability um, is some, actually something we observe in patients with lung disease when their patterns, their flexibility, their robustness of the system just isn't, you know, isn't the same. It's pathological. So again, we, you know, you know, when we start assessing things, you know, there, you know, there is going to always be a little bit of difference between each breath. That's a, that's a normal thing. Okay. Um, and like, again, I'm, like I mentioned, the microcircuitry and the respiratory CPG, you know, allows for these breathing patterns um, that are adaptive, that we can switch to different demands. And again, the classic example of that is exercise. We see different areas in the brain light up, um, you know, when we, when we begin the exercise. We actually think some of this might be even feed forward. We think that, you know, when we select a motor program to exercise, the areas that, you know, our body would expect to turn on and become more active um, kind of current turn on around the same time. So we think there may be this um, kind of, um, you know, feed forward mechanism to prepare ourselves to, to breathe 
um, to meet our certain demands. Um, we do find that breathing does appear to become entrained to locomotion and different like somatosensory and auditory feedbacks. Like we can, we can pace ourselves. Um, however, I do um, want to state that this something is generally automatic. It's not conscious. We don't typically think about this. You can try to pace yourself, um, but you know, as you do more rhythmic, you know, activities and stuff, this tends to become a um, a uh, in, entrainment ensues. So uh, the control of breathing again, you know, the respiratory control system um, reacts very efficiently. Like I mentioned, we are very good at keeping. Um, yeah, we're very, very, very good at breathing, and it's it's critical for that because breathing is one of our ways to quickly maintain blood pH. Um, so whenever we notice a change in pH, so if we, for example, uh, notice that pH starts to uh, decrease a little bit, become a little bit more acidic, and we see more PCO2, which is you know becomes a conjugate um, acid in our in our in our blood respiratory rate and depth will, will increase to move more CO2 out of the body to normalize pH. This happens automatically. You don't have to think about it. And it's mediated by these chemoreceptors. Um, again, they're located in the carotid bodies and as well as in the ventral rostrum medulla. Um, so again, in a normal healthy system, we are heavily dependent on arterial and cerebral spinal fluid, um, partial pressure CO2. Again, if we have too much CO2, right? Too much CO2, breathing rate will increase to expel more CO2 to bring it back to normal. If we notice CO2 is too low, we will slow breathing rate um, so we can kind of hold on to a little bit more. Again, it's all about balancing out the pH. Again, the chemoreceptors are the main drivers here. Um, what we don't really control, like PaO2 does not have that much of an influence on breathing rate. Um, in fact, you know, we can find that, you know, we, the people can have a PaO2 as high as sometimes a thousand millimeters of mercury. We're not going to see much change on respiratory drive. It has virtually no effect. Now, there are some situations um, where this changes, right? There are some situations where this changes in patients of respiratory disease. Um, we'll talk more about them, but uh, again, you know, PaO2 is not the main driver, it's PCO2. And we can go as low as even a 60 before we start seeing even you know, wholesale changes in uh, the respiratory control center. So again, PaO, P, PCO2 is our primary driver of respiratory, respiratory drive. It's our primary influence. And again, we have a wide, wide range for acceptable O2 from 60 all the way up to about a, a thousand. And the 60 really corresponds, if you remember that oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, that's when we start seeing, if you go below that, hemoglobin is not likely to stay bound, right? Or saturated, the saturation rate is decreased significantly when PaO2 decreases, remember that curve. Um, and as, again, this is not true for carbon dioxide because like, you know, no matter if it's blood or tissue, PCO2 changes like, you know, very heavily influence the uh, pulmonary ventilation. We don't, you know, it, it, it's controlled in a very tight, tight window, and that's because of the influence of PCO2 on blood pH. Um, where this organ all occurs um, is in our our pons and our medulla. We have our pre bonsinger complexes, which are located in the ventral rostral medulla. It's a major source of inspiratory activity. The, uh, the pre uh, interacts with the adjacent bonsinger complex. Uh, which contains mainly expiratory neurons, and they work kind of in, in, in unison with each other. Um, and again, like I mentioned, the control of breathing is, again, it's controlled by the CPGs. We get multiple, multiple, multiple inputs, and then the CPG processes these things to have uh, the most appropriate output or modulation to that, you know, that baseline rhythm produced by the CPG. And we're finding that um, you know, the motor programs for breathing, the CPG, the hardwired, you know, uh, subconscious pattern are developed in the third trimester, right? We see respiratory activity in these regions, um, you know, these patterns, these areas light up um, in the third trimester. Even before you begin to actually need to breathe on your own, you're practicing it. So again, this is a very hardwired process, and that's a good thing. You don't want to have to think about 
um, breathing and we want it to be nice and coordinated. In fact, again, we, you know, a loss of the coordination, this pre-inspiratory activity that we see kind of occur in the, the Botzinger complex occurs in patients um, with Parkinson's disease. We actually think this changes to the respiratory CPG may explain why we see a large prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea in Parkinson's disease. It's also important, which I also think goes very underappreciated, um, that there are other muscles, right, that you know are involved here. We think again, obviously, the diaphragms, that the end effector here through the phrenic nerve. However, the you know the output from the respiratory CPG, the prebonsegger especially, sends a signal to the hypoglossal nerve, which even precedes the respiratory signal to the phrenic nerve. This is to move the tongue out of the way and contract muscles in the upper airway and larynx to abduct and open up the airways. Um, we actually find that this may be um, one of the reasons why um, patients with dysphagia or strokes have you know, issues um, with, with breathing. It's this, this lack of this control, right? this coordinated activity um, to move out the tongue and abduct the airways to keep them open. So you might actually see quite a few speech therapists doing things with respiratory muscle training and breathing coaching because of coordinating those laryngeal muscles. It's really, really, really important. And again, I think people forget the hypoglossal nerve is pretty important too. And again, just an example of those, those pre bonsinger and bonsinger complexes. So again, I, I like this, this image here just to show you the multiple different inputs. Obviously, chemoreceptors, we're really talking about CO2 and, and hydrogen ion concentration are the, are the primary drivers. But again, we can have um, other inputs. There's receptors in the muscles and joints, metaboreceptors, mechanoreceptors, different irritants, stress receptors, um, you know, all input to our respiratory control center. But we can also have those higher level right? Those, those like cortical inputs. We can think to breathe faster. We can even think to hold our breath, but primarily breathing is a hardwired subconscious state dependent activity. You don't think about it. And um, in fact, there's an old adage in respiratory physiology, you, you know, you know, if you decide to hold your breath, what do you end up, end up doing? You pass out and then your that CPG takes over again, right? So again, it, we're, we're very fortunate that we don't have to think about breathing. It's just something that we do automatically. Now, in terms of the neuro, uh, neural signal, so breathing, uh, the motor activity follows a ramping signal. It starts up a little bit um, kind of weakly, and then over a period of about two seconds, it begins to ramp up. This gradual um, ramping up and ramping back down allows for, again, a smooth transition between phase of the of the breathing cycle if we were to you know abrupt you know you know ceaselessly you know if we were able to if we abrupt breathing um, or if we cease breathing abruptly and we cause very large fluctuations we want breathing to kind of be a slow gradual process and to have that you know that pause of the signal at the end for about three seconds to allow for the recoil um, of the you know the of the diaphragm as well as the uh, chest wall, which again is being driven by the recoil of the lungs, and again this you know it, ramping up and ramping down allows for the you know the a smooth breathing pattern that that permits gas exchange to not be abrupt, right? To allow airflow to be more consistent. Um, we actually find that patients when they have a high spinal cord lesion or not spinal cord lesion or a brain lesion. They have a brain lesion. Um, this pattern is lost. We actually see an agonal pattern where the breathing is abrupt, and that's not a normal sign. You'll learn more of that, about that probably if you do a CPR course, what that what that looks like. But breathing under a normal resting state has this this ramping um, morphology to the uh, to the to the motor output to the muscles. Um, and again, just as a reiterate, you know there are cortical inputs, right? We we get very, very, um, and we're going to have a very varied um, number of inputs, right? So again, we talked about, you know, the chemoreceptors are the primary driver, but there can also be conscious inputs. There can also be emotional inputs. Um, and you guys can all, you know, speak to this, right? If you were experiencing something that was scary to you or anxious to you, your breathing rate's going to go up. And um, we think a lot of it has to do with, you um, you know, how you know, anxiety goes up, sympathetic nervous system goes up, the sympathetic nervous system has projections to the respiratory control center, which are important for exercise responses. Um, and, you know, 
you would see those same projections occurring under anxiety or pain or fear, um, which can also call these, um, cause these you know, changes. So again, breathing is a state dependent behavior, right, or activity. And again, there can be multiple different inputs. Emotions can be a big one, um, you know, as well. Just an example of, you know, the limbic system inputs. Now, um, in terms of the pulmonary response to exercise, we talked about this uh, before, but again, um, our oxygen demands for breathing are, are pretty minimal even during exercise. Um, we do see a concomitant, you know, we do see an increase with exercise um, in ventilation. However, the key thing to take away from the exercise uh, response um, is that P arterial PO2 stays consistent. If you guys remember that AVO2 graph, we don't really see major changes in arterial PO2, even at the onset of exercise. We also don't see significant changes in PCO2. So we're talking about arterial CO2. Actually, what happens near the end, PCO2 begins to decrease, especially with incremental exercise. Um, and we'll explain kind of why that happens. Um, during exercise, uh, what we observe is um, there is an inflection point where ventilation ceases to be linear. It almost becomes uh, exponential. So what this does is we ex you know, expend more and more CO2 out of the blood, um, which causes CO2 in the blood to, gra to gradually decrease. Okay. Uh, this inflection point is often referred to as a ventilatory threshold. Um, it occurs roughly in most individuals about you know 60% of their VO2. Depending on their training and level of intensity, they can they can operate at it and maybe push further um, away. But um, and that corresponds quite closely to where we start seeing uh, their anaerobic threshold hit in. So um, again, you know, you know it's more of a th exercise physiology concept. Don't want to get too deep into it, but. Key thing to remember, during exercise, ventilation increases, um, PO2 stays consistent, PCO2 stays consistent. After we get to a certain level of intensity, we start seeing PCO2 actually decrease, okay? Again, this is just an example here. Um, and then just some reminders, again, we think you know, low workloads, ventilation increases proportionally with VO2 and VCO2. I think there may be a feed forward mechanism that helps prepare ourselves to breathe at the meat demands. There are there's feedback from most muscle afferents. Some can be mechanical. I can talk about just passive motion. There's obviously the meta metabolic, the metaboreceptors. And then we have high workloads. At high workloads above 60% of our VO2 max. Ventilation increases out of proportion to VO2, uh, but does stay relatively proportional to CO2. Um, and what we end up seeing there is, uh, again, PaO2 starts to decrease. Again, just showing this here again. It starts linearly. Once we get to about 60%, we see that hype, you know, that exponential increase in ventilation. And we think that has to do with the liberation of hydrogen ions as well as other byproducts which act on the chemoreceptors, act on metaboreceptors to facilitate a, a much more rapid increase in, in breathing. And we'll talk you know, more about that later on um, in some of our extra phys exercise physiology content. Uh, so that's breathing in a nutshell. Um, you know, again, it, the really important part of this is to understand that, you know, what is normal so we can appreciate uh, abnormalities when uh, we observe it. And uh, that'll be the topic for our next lecture. Thank you.